Hello, everyone, and a warm welcome to our Marine Money Cyprus 2020 virtual forum. Mia and I are sorry that we're not in the Four Seasons Hotel in Limassol, but in the world we are living in, virtual events are what we can do. Just before I continue with the session, I have one or two ground rules, please. All guests listening in are on mute to maintain quality control. During the session, you can send in questions in the box, which is currently shown on your screen. I will receive those uh, questions and ask some of them on your behalf at the end of the session. To collapse the window, enabling a full screen, just use the arrow at the top. So our discussion uh, today is entitled, Do the Negative Economic Headlines Mask a Silver Lining? And it's definitely the case that we're seeing a lot of negative uh, headlines in the press, on the TV, uh, in the shipping press, even in everywhere we look. A lot about uh, COVID and its uh, spread and uh, it, the worry, current worrying situation that it's spreading so fast uh, currently. And this uh, leading to negative economic growth in many, many countries. Government support leading to massive uh, uh, state debt levels. Reduced consumer demand, negative interest rates and so on and so forth. So the headline news does not sound good, but is there a silver lining. Ready to discuss this are our Andrea Sassiotis, Chief Economist at Hellenic Bank, and Tim Power, Managing Director and Head of Maritime Advisors at Drury Shipping Consultants. Both our speakers have some slides as an introduction, and I will ask Andreas to speak first. Andreas, please. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kevin. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you, Andres. It's a pleasure to be here yet for another year. I think I think this is the fourth time that uh, I'm invited in, in this uh, prestigious event on marine money. And uh, with my participation as Hellenic, we demonstrate uh, our confidence first in the sector and also that uh, uh, we support the sector. Um, today, uh, the headline of this session will be to the negative economic headlines mask a silver lining uh, and let's let's shift to the next slide please kevin here i'm trying to put the put in front of you the global macro themes that uh based on what i feel that are the more important notes uh that we should be factoring uh in um, we all know that this new pandemic is causing an unprecedented shock. Obviously, it has been met with an unprecedented policy response, I would say, both from a uh, fiscal uh, side as well as the uh, monetary uh, front. Even though the monetary policy has been accommodative for quite some time, I mean, the last four years, we have been talking about lower interest rates. And only back in 2019, we started seeing um, uh, uh, depositors being charged uh, negative rates, meaning they're passing through this uh, parking fee that the ECB, for example, is charging local banks, is um, being translated to negative rates in um, depositors. So this shock uh, has been met with one aim, which has been to maintain employment, uh, employ the factor of production of employment, which will result in uh, maintaining disposable income. To a large extent, I would say that this has been achieved. Uh, and uh, besides the concerns of an increase in the government spending and the subsequent increase in national debt, which is the second point you're seeing below, uh, this should not cause fears, if you would like, or is not posing an imminent threat. Why? Because this expense that you see from the government support side is something that must have happened. So in the subsequent year, the government should be able to get some revenues. If the governments were able to support then you can understand that they will be struggling in the next year because if unemployment will have picked up uh, at levels that we have seen in the past crisis, then it will have been difficult for uh, firms to have some economic activity, 
and therefore the government's collecting taxes. Of course, uh, as we learn more about this uh, pandemic and as we, as we also uh, understand the situations of each firms, then it, ob it is obvious that this government support should be coming more targeted. Another global theme uh, is the interest rates that uh, I think it was in this forum that I mentioned uh, that uh, they will be lower for longer. Now I have just added uh, that interest rates will be remaining lower for much longer. We are seeing all this fiscal stimulus, uh, which essentially comes from bond buying by the European Central Bank and also the Federal Bank. Uh, in the US and other central banks have been very accommodative, driving lower interest very low. Uh, and if you can see the swap rates uh, on the European yields, you will see that they turned positive in year 10. So interest rates will remain low uh, for much longer. And one silver lining here, because this is what Kevin was asking, whether there is any silver lining here uh, through this pandemic, is that once we are sufficiently left control this pandemic, and I'm not saying fully control, once we sufficiently control it, we will be left with an ongoing economic rebound and lower interest rates. So the recovery will eventually come. And uh, in some cases we have seen it, it started coming. Uh, sometimes I see comparisons between uh, the months during the lockdowns across the world uh, and the data that comes in right after uh, the lockdown. And uh, of course, all indicators uh, were actually skyrocketing, except for example, hospitality sector. We have seen pent up demand actually being released. Pent up demand is the demand that did not have the chance to be expressed through sales during the lockdown. Of course, this pent up demand on, oh, mostly relates to um, uh, the durable goods, because on the dur non-durable goods, you wouldn't be able to see this pent-up demand. And let me explain here a bit, and then I will, uh, you, you, I will help you uh, with, with a thought. Uh, if you didn't go to a restaurant five, six times during the lockdown period, it doesn't mean that with the uplift of measures, you will be going uh, 10 times or five, six times to the restaurant because you missed out before. Uh, that would be for uh, non-durable goods. But if you actually didn't buy certain things that you wanted, then this is the pent-up demand that will come on the durables where you will see even retail sales increasing at levels higher than pre-COVID. And why am I mentioning this? because we have seen across the world these statistics actually happening, but now as we are moving towards a more normalized um, world, uh, more, more, normal, more normalized economic conditions, uh, we are seeing a weakening of these retail sales. And we start saying that, okay, so the momentum, the momentum is being uh, shifted away. That is not the case. The case is that we are comparing with a high base, the same, way that we were comparing with a very low base during the lockdown period. Now, it, will be, it wouldn't be right to conclude results that uh, because of a weakening on retail sales, because of the high pent-up demand, that um, uh, we're actually seeing uh, the return in a W shape, let's say, um, uh, recession. Of course, we are far from over from this pandemic. Uh, obviously, uh, the virus is so dynamic and uh, we need to be open to scenario switching and operating on different uh, macroeconomic scenarios. But at the same time, we know uh, much more than what we knew back in uh, February and March. Uh, and specifically, we know that it's not that deadly, this virus. At least this is a, a perception that I uh, that I have based on the information that I have been accumulating. I'm not downplaying the virus, but it's not as deadly. But also the healthcare systems, at least of the Western world, are much more prepared compared to uh, the situations uh, back in March, even in Cyprus. We have seen uh, a new section with uh, 50 ICUs, uh, 
uh, we have seen preparations and uh, some agreements with private hospitals to create capacity if needed. Uh, and of course, this is the case in all um, all, uh, all countries or the majority of the countries. Healthcare sectors are much more prepared. We know what works and what doesn't work now. Uh, we know that full lockdowns uh, is not the way to go uh, and all these curfews. Some restrictions, yes. Some limitations of movement, yes. Social distancing, yes. Protection measures, yes. But going back to full lockdowns, then I don't think that this is uh, the solution and this is not the preferred uh, solution so far uh, based on uh, the different um, uh, information we gather from different countries even at this moment where we're actually seeing uh, a second wave of, of this virus. Uh, another global macro theme that I would like to mention relates to the US election policy uh, and there is some uncertainty there and also on the UK exit from the EU single market. Uh, we, it, it is pending to see what kind of uh, exit or whether there will be hard exit uh, from uh, UK uh, so it is really important to be monitoring these things. Obviously, there is not a single answer on how things will evolve, but it's definitely something that we should be uh, monitoring. With regards to the US election, I would say that uh, it is important uh, to understand where we sit in this economic cycle. Uh, I wouldn't uh, believe that it's over, this uh, election, uh, outcome. Uh, we are seeing that uh, Trump uh, is gaining some momentum over the last two days. The, 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 the um, uh, websites that I follow at least, uh, the Bentic odds uh, and the ballots uh, demonstrate that Biden is still uh, a favor. Uh, but uh, this was also the case at the exact time in the cycle in 2016. Uh, currently, the probability is around 65% uh, for Biden, 35% for President Trump. Uh, in the same period of 2016, the, the probabilities were 80% for Hillary and 20% uh, for Trump. And then uh, we had this uh, surprise, the unexpected surprise. But why, why do, do we care about uh, this, uh, this outcome? Uh, the U.S. being a net importer means that if the U.S. is doing well, the rest of the world is doing well. And we need to be able to understand what each uh, candidate is bringing to the table. I'm not trying to have here a political um, assessment, but through Biden, we will be expecting uh, dramatically higher spending, uh, but also taxes and more regulation. Uh, with Biden, we'll have uh, a larger government control, uh, obviously less concern on uh, China and tariffs. With Trump, we will be having uh, higher spending, but lower taxes, reduced regulations. Um, we also expect that there will be hardline on China favoring uh, tariffs, something which is not what at least economists uh, think that uh, will, something will be working. Also, some anti-trade nationalism, uh, the relationship with um, Europe, uh, and overall an aggressive anti-global establishment on all issues. Uh, the final global macro theme, which is a silver lining of all that I see here, is that we have all these recovery plans, especially here uh, in Europe where 750 billion euros have been agreed uh, to serve as a stimulus on all uh, member states. This is a lifetime opportunity to encourage reforms, sustainable, inclusive, and green growth in a relatively unconstrained way. Obviously, um, the Commission did not agree on a blanket uh, checks that will be submitting to the member states. We are talking about some action plans that need to be put in place. Uh, and these action plans need to abide to the EU priorities. But this is a great chance for all member states to proceed with all these reforms 
uh, that are needed uh, again in a in a relatively um, unconstrained way because the ticket sizes are le uh, relatively large. If we can shift to the next slide, and I, I will pretty uh, I'll go pretty fast here. Uh, it's just to see the world today in 2020 based on the latest IMF figures. We are seeing this unprecedented shock that I explained before. So uh, all of the world is actually in a recession except China, which is expected to have a growth rate of around 2% uh, for the year. Uh, in the next slide, we have exactly the same map but for 2021, meaning that we are expecting a gradual rebound uh, from this um, deep global recession. Uh, again, you see here that we are moving to a more uh, synchronized uh, global recovery. I wouldn't say growth because uh, it was mentioned before about this not being a V-shape. We do expect a tick-shape recovery here. And then in 2022, if we can shift to the next slide, we are seeing that things will start normalizing. That's why the majority of the graphs here show this lighter green, uh, meaning that um, the majority of the countries will be enjoying growth rates uh, in the range of 0 to 3%. Uh, and this is the expectation for the short uh, to medium term horizon. If we just see in the next slide the economic powers, uh, at least based on my assessment, uh, we should be caring what India is doing and China. A big recession in India of minus 10%, but then a relatively strong rebound. China, 2% increase despite the large uh, contraction in the first quarter and the second quarter of 2020. Still, we'll be able to enjoy a high growth rate, a relatively higher growth rate in 2020, but in 2021, uh, around 10% uh, increase in uh, its real GDP. The US, uh, a relatively milder recession compared to what it was expected back in, back in March, uh, with a strong, I would say, comeback. Europe will be uh, having some more trouble because we have to factor in that uh, we were in an anemic growth environment back in 2019 still. Therefore, it will take some more time for Euro area to uh, pick up. And Japan uh, also uh, will be having a large contraction of 5% and uh, also because of the anemic uh, conditions we had back in 2019 and 18, uh, the abenomics, the well-known abenomics, we, we expect a relatively weak uh, rebound. So uh, let's shift to the next slide. I mentioned it uh, before, but uh, just to give here a point. So uh, what we learned from the past crisis is that, especially in times of uncertainty, we need to be operating with more than one economic scenario. And to the extent that we can still attach probabilities to different macroeconomic scenarios, it is important to acknowledge that the tails of a distribution, as you can see in the graph, uh, become flatter. So uh, the factor, uh, the factor tails, uh, and the lower probability of that baseline scenario that you can see in front of you unfolding imply that more than ever we have to think about the outlook in terms of different scenarios and to be open to scenario switching depending on the actual policies that get implemented. Uh, I assume that all of the participants are running their own business, so. The lesson is that we shall not be operating with on one baseline scenario. It's to have different scenarios with the different probabilities attached to it. Differ uh, risk and uncertainty are totally different things. Risk are the uh, known unknowns. Uncertainty is the unknown unknown. You cannot attach a probability to uh, uncertainty on the risk. You can attach a, prob a probability. And uh, some risks that uh, are ahead of us, as I said before, uh, besides the pandemic, is the UK's disorderly hard exit from the EU single market, the US elections, and the accompanied protectionism that uh, might come. I will stop here. These are the high level points that I, want, I wanted to mention. Uh, I will finish with that.
uh, once we are sufficiently uh, having this pandemic under control, we will be left with an ongoing economic rebound and relatively lower interest rates for much longer. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, very much indeed. Uh, you see on this last slide Andreas' um, email address. If you have any questions or would like to discuss anything further, please get in touch with him. I'd like now to um, introduce uh, Tim Power. He's going to give a few comments more from a shipping angle. Um, uh, Tim, please. Great. Um, if we look back at the history of this pandemic, um, you'll remember it all seems a very long time ago that China was shut down just after Chinese New Year. Uh, and suddenly the whole of the whole of the global shipping industry went in, began to go into uh, crisis. Um, gradually that the pandemic spread uh, around the world so that by the spring, uh, Western economies were all shutting down. And so you have this rolling effect, um, which is um, it's like a wave moving through all the all the all economies and all industries uh, and um, particularly the shipping industry so what i'm going to do in this is just to pick out a few things a few sectors um, just to highlight some interesting points uh, and i think one thing i'd also say and this is echoing what the what the minister was saying earlier is that all the big issues that were confronting us in shipping about um, uh, esg um, getting to zero carbon, et cetera. These are all still with us. Um, and these will affect not only the shipping industry itself, but the trades that they serve. Um, so Kevin, can we go to the first slide? Uh, this is just um, for your information, ladies and gentlemen, just so you can see the, the um, macroeconomic assumptions that we are uh, using when we do our forecasting now. Uh, these, these are forecasts prepared by Oxford Economics. And I think the general picture is very similar to that presented by Andreas. Essentially, global contraction of 4.4% in 2020, and then growth of GDP globally of 5.4% in 2021, and then uh, growth uh, slowing after that. Uh, maybe Andreas is um, a prognosis will be more optimistic, but anyway, that's what we work on. So I'm going to start look, just talking about the container sector first, uh, and and I'm going to talk a touch a little bit about um, some silver linings in, in this sector in particular. Um, what we saw, uh, not surprisingly, was a very rapid contraction, particularly um, in uh, in Q2, where, where we were looking around something like a, an eight uh, percent year-on-year contraction. Um, but actually, uh, the, this, um, uh, the shipping of general cargo has been much more resilient than we had originally expected. And in fact, the overall contraction in, in uh, 2020 is only going to be uh, roughly 3.3%, which is much better than we expected. You can see that we have three scenarios for 2021. Um, one high, high case where we are looking for um, growth above 10%, which is rather similar to the bounce we got after the, the great financial crisis. But there, if, there's also the possibility, um, if we can't get on top of this pandemic, that actually we, uh, we go into contraction again in um, Q1 uh, 2021. So, so anyway, that's just to give you some background as to what the outlook is. When we look at the next, uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see how the shipping lines res responded to this. And I think of all the sectors, liner shipping is now the best equipped structurally to cope with this kind of crisis uh, and if we have time later we might just touch on why that is if you look at the the yellow line uh, the the sort of turquoise line and the dark blue line you can see that those are the um, contractions in capacity that lines made uh, in q2 in response to the downturn uh, and they, they moved very fast, very decisively, and they did it for two reasons. First of all, they had to cut the costs. Um, and so they did that by reducing services. But the other, a much more important point was they had to keep up capacity utilization. Uh, the golden rule in container shipping is if you're 90% utilized on your head hauls, you will make money. If you get down to 85%, the tariff will start collapsing and you'll be um, uh, on the road to oblivion very quickly. The lines realized that they remembered the lessons of the uh, 2009 crisis and they did not uh, repeat that experience. In fact, they have managed it extraordinarily well. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see what has happened to container shipping rates in 2020. Um, 
you can see that um, from you, you, you remember a long, it seems ages ago now, but um, in the run up to 1st of January, we were all thinking about IMO 2020, um, fuel surcharges, uh, and all of those things, which is a distant memory now. Uh, so, so that was the run up to January. And then you had, the, and, and also Chinese New Year, of course, is the peak period. You had some typical seasonal erosion, but you had nothing like the collapse in sea freight rates um, that we saw in the great financial crisis, where uh, particularly on the Asian North Europe trade, the rates were just obliterated. Um, and uh, on the Transpac, they dropped by around 35%. Nothing like that this time. And you can see that really through the, the most difficult period of Q2, rates were stable. Now you're getting this deferred demand that Andreas was talking about coming back, and particularly in the US, and, and rates are now rocketing. Um, and actually, there was a statement by Jeremy Nixon of one um, recently to say that um, we are completely sold out. We have no space. We have no boxes. Um, every vessel that anyone can lay their hands on is being chartered. And so suddenly this, there is a, not only have the, the lines managed this um, capacity control in the downturn, but now, now, now they're experiencing a, a, a boom of demand um, in, in the transpect trade. So there really is a big silver lining um, in, the, uh, in the container trades. Um, and if we look at the next slide, we can see how that has translated into earnings in the first half. Um, the purple, um, the purple lines show the profit in um, first half uh, uh, 2020, and the uh, the blue lines on the left, or well, the left hand side, is the losses incurred in in the in the previous year. Everybody's making money now, um, and after a decade of miserable per financial performance in the container shipping industries, uh, this is a really quite a remarkable achievement. So um, um, sunshine on the liner trades. Um, Let's uh, let's go next to uh, dry bulk, um, where actually you see um, I'm showing a, a variety of cases here because we're not quite sure how things will pan out. But the, the, our our base case assumption ex expectation is that global dry bulk trade will contract by three percent in 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 2020, uh, and then we'll bounce back uh, with growth uh, of 4.5 percent in 2021. Um, if we go to what are the main um, drivers of the, of the bulk trade, the, the, the big commodities, of course, are thermal coal, coking coal, and iron ore. And if we go to the next slide, we can see um, what is happening on the iron ore story. And this is a reminder, of, as if we needed one, of how important China is uh, in the global well, global shipping markets, but particularly uh, global dry bulk trade. Um, here we see what is happening to iron ore imports, um, and you can see that we have um, massive contraction of iron ore in the EU, uh, massive contraction in Japan, but uh, but continued growth in China. Uh, and I, I think uh, it was the Chinese um, economic growth numbers for Q3 were out the other day. I think it's four and a half percent growth in. Um, uh, in Q3. So China is very much back on its feet uh, and um, steel production is growing and iron, iron ore imports are also growing. Uh, and that's of course very important, um, um, particularly when we think about Brazil, which we'll come on to in a minute. Thermal coal is a very different story. Um, and you can see that all over the place, uh, it, is in, uh, it is in contraction. Um, there are some countries, uh, Vietnam, you'll see at the bottom of the chart where you've got growth, but almost everywhere is contracting. And, uh, and I think the, the, um, the, there is the, the, you will all have heard the statement from um, President Xi in September, China is a commitment to go to uh, uh, carbon neutral by 2060. Um, although you know there is obviously a bit of a power struggle between the center and uh, regional governments about, about thermal power, uh, my personal view is that thermal power is um, is history, um, and and this obviously has major implications um, for uh, for shipping, particularly Cape size owners. So then, um, if if we then what what happened to earnings in in these various uh, markets? Um, no silver lining, no ability to manage capacity in these um, bulk markets, far too fragmented. And as a result, you have an absolute horror show in the Cape size market. 
uh, which is then saved in July by the resumption of iron ore movements um, from Brazil. And you can see the rate ticking up there. Um, some of that is filtering through um, into um, uh, into the Panamaxes, um, and other, the other sectors, of course, are naturally more stable. Um, uh, but the Capes um, have had a very torrid time in uh, in 2020. Um, we can see how that translates on the next slide into um, into earnings, um, and essentially this is this is the, the left hand chart is showing the um, declines in time charter rates uh, the blue blue column is um, is um, first half um, 2020 versus first half 2019 for some listed companies everybody is earning less uh, and that is translating into negative um, uh, net income um, for for all these listed companies so um, perhaps uh, um, saved a bit by Brazil uh, toward uh, sort of in the middle of the year, but really not much of a silver lining um, for uh, for dry bulk operators. Perhaps the only bright spark is is grain, uh, where um, that trade is continuing to grow because we all have to eat. Um, if we come to oil now, this has been. If, if we remember the whole story of this year, uh, this chart doesn't really show you what's happening, except that it says there is an 8% demand contraction of oil, oil demand in 2020. But of course, what that uh, and what is particularly important for the shipping markets is is the um, what happened in the middle of the uh, well earlier in the year in this great standoff between Russia and Saudi Arabia about oil market share. Um, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, as a result of this, um, uh, the, we, we, we have a 8% um, decline in um, uh, uh, oil, oil um, crude oil demand, but we have a much bigger drop uh, in, uh, in refined uh, product. Well, the refined trade was um, down by around 20%. So that was um, really horrendous. Um, if we go to the next slide, though, we can see that actually that did not that what very gloomy picture is not what happened in the in rates and the reason was of course we have the the, the Saudi Arabia Russia oil standoff um, everybody kept pumping all the on land storage was full and therefore um, tankers uh, crew tankers and product tankers were being used for um, floating storage and therefore you had an absolute earnings bonanza um, totally. Uh, unrelated to the underlying economy, it related to a fight between two major powers, uh, and that's that was the silver lining for um, uh, for the tanker market. But uh, this is e ephemeral. Uh, it could happen again um, if uh, if there's overproduction of oil. Certainly, that possibility remains there, um, but it is certainly not something you can bank on. So uh, I, th this is. I just wanted to show you a few highlights. Uh, we we could spend all day on on the shipping markets uh, and the effect on of COVID, but um, I want to leave some time for questions. So in a nutshell, what I would say is um, the major silver lining in this in the whole industry is that the container shipping lines are now structurally in a position. They demonstrate that they can manage their way through a crisis and make record profits. That's the that is the big takeaway from this. I think on the on the dry and uh, oil sectors, uh, the longer term is much more challenging. Thermal coal is on the way out. Um, decarbonisation is going to have major implications in the long run for, for the oil trades, uh, and therefore, uh, obviously, when you get a bit of sunshine like um, the Saudi um, Russia standoff, um, you make hay, um, uh, but you can't rely on it. Um, Kevin, that's the end of my uh, few comments, and I'm um, happy to join the discussion now. Uh, thank you, Tim. Thank you very much. And if Andreas can come back, come back on again, please. Here he comes. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, my, the, the question was, um, are there silver linings? Actually, both of you are, I would say, relatively optimistic. So one question I have is, um, you know, I mean, there, there are concerns and there were concerns of slow and negative economic growth and how the world can adapt. And in a, several months ago, you know, a phrase that we often heard was demand erosion. And obviously demand erosion meant that people weren't spending money. Therefore, there, you know, the, the, the chances are, um, you know, the economies would um, contract and they will do and all the rest of it. But the story from four or five months ago is very different from the story today and is likely to be very different from the story 
in a few months. So, Andreas, could, could you have a couple of comments on that? This is a very fluid and sort of changing situation, isn't it? So, you mean on whether the demand would be flattening? Well, whether whether you know the situation has improved a lot from the worst days several months ago, and you know it's going to change again. Yes. I suppose. Okay. Yes. So yes, I do believe that the situation uh, has improved a lot. Uh, as I just just see, I mean, uh, unemployment picked up in the U.S. really high, and then uh, we have seen a sharp decline. Uh, this is already an indication. If we wouldn't manage to see. A downward trend on unemployment, then we will we should have started worrying because honestly it will have taken two three years to see a normalized condition. Now this is not to say that everything is great and that uh, I don't want to portray a rosy picture, not at all. But uh, also we need to factor in uh, the expectations in this equation. Uh, we should not be cultivating this negative sentiment because eventually what will happen. Uh, you all know this uh, self-fulfilling prophecy uh, uh, phenomenon. Uh, the the virus is uh, is dynamic. I mentioned it before. Uh, we need to reassess constantly what is happening. But a great extent of this economic con contraction that uh, we had at the time was related to this uh, stop, sudden stop in economic activity. Uh, personally, the way that I think I see things evolving is that uh, we should not be having these sharp or sudden stops in economic activity from harsh lockdowns. Yes, we are seeing some restrictive measures uh, to certain clusters, uh, but uh, I think that uh, once a, a new vaccine is out there, uh, not necessarily to be uh, used by all the population, but just the sentiment that it, this will create. It will not vanquish the whole thing just because we're having a new vaccine. Uh, we have a vaccine for the flu, but uh, still there are people dying from the flu. It's just the sentiment uh, and also how speedy will be this assessment of whether you have COVID or not. This will also help airlines. So imagine that you have a test that within 10 minutes you get the result so if you can actually do it you, then you, you can travel this will give much more confidence for people to travel so i'm quite confident as i said before once we sufficiently put this pandemic under uh, control mm. okay thank you uh tim if you'd like to comment on that i mean things a few months ago looked pretty bleak but it's changed hasn't it well, I think, as I said earlier, when we looked at the container numbers, um, the fact that we are now projecting a, a contraction of only 3.3% is a big surprise to us. You remember, we remember the global financial crisis, we had a contraction of 10%, um, but it, then there was a bounce of 14 So, um, So the, the contraction has been much less bad. Um, and just sort of talking about the outlook, which is what Andreas was talking about, people getting back on planes, you know, our forecast for 2021 in the product trades is, a, is growth of 18%. Okay, it's on a low base, but it's a, it's a, big, a big bounce. So, uh, you know, obviously we're keeping our fingers crossed, but the, it all seems to have been much more resilient. And there's one other thing um, that, that perhaps I should have mentioned when I was going through these sectors, of course, if we compare with the, the great financial crisis, the big problem for shipping at that time was we had a colossal order book. You know, some sectors had 30% or more of the fleet on order. Um, now it's all below 10 across the board. Um, and so you don't have this vast overhang of, of capacity to be delivered that's going to trash everything uh, in a low growth environment. And that, that, is a, that is a big silver lining for the industry. Yeah, yeah, Sorry, if I ask something here, I think the current stage of uh, where we were standing at the initiation of this crisis does matter. It's like the health of a person, okay? If you are relatively healthier and then uh, you get a virus, uh, it will be much easier to uh, get well sooner if mm -hmm. the health of the person was uh, in a better position, was more prepared. The same thing with the economy. So uh, the current stage uh, that we were in the economic cycle uh, did provide some help, uh, at least this is my opinion, especially the fiscal position of all countries. 
and the immediate support of the governments, because if they were operating with uh, budget deficits, then it would have been much more difficult to have these swift fiscal responses. Okay. Let me ask you a, a, a question about the sort of um, the pol political leadership we have at this moment in the world. I mean, because I think a lot of the success of getting out of this uh, situation will depend on you know fiscal decisions, government decisions, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have, like you said, you have elections coming up in the U.S. We have a situation with Brexit. We have um, uh, Mr. Xi in China, sort of, you know, pretty much in control, but also talking now about um, carbon neutral situations going forward. There's a lot of things up in the air there as well. So generally, uh, uh, you know, so the, the, the kind of political leadership of major countries do they understand where we are and what has to be done uh, to get us out of the situation, Tim? Well, I, I think. <laughs> it's variable. Uh, I mean, if we take the the, e, the Brexit story just very quickly, if you look at the, what are the motivations of the two parties, and unfortunately, I believe the motivations are not a can on are probably ideological on both sides. Um, the EU's main Commission's main objective, in my opinion, which may be wrong, is that it must make sure that this never happens again. Um, in that sense, it's good if Britain suffers. Um, for Britain, um, Boris Johnson is elected on a sovereignty. Uh, he cannot make concessions that would undermine that. So both parties, uh, it's, it is a Mexican standoff. Whether anyone will blink or not, I don't know. Uh, uh, when we talk about Xi, totally different world, um, he's the emperor. But the emperor in Chinese tradition requires the mandate of heaven. Uh, and the mandate of heaven actually is um, often demonstrated through natural phenomena such as floods you know lots of dynasties fell because of severe flooding and I think that this maybe subliminally is one of the motivations behind this um, this uh, carbon neutral thing a lot of chi young Chinese youngsters will have the same concerns as they do in the West they want the environment to be dealt with and I think that th this uh, this is she's uh, demonstrating that he still has the mandate of heaven okay Andreas, any comments on uh, political leadership? Yes, I mean, what I would say is that political re leaders, uh, the way I see it is that it's not that they are uh, uh, against globalization. Uh, uh, they are more, um, I would say, focused on uh, their own sovereigns. Okay, so the, you see this, like it's a return to uh safeguarding the sovereign the national and not seeing all this uh, potential uh, from uh, globalization but i think uh, on, on your initial question yes i do th i do think that they understand what are the uh, key items i would say in the agenda and uh, with the help of other institutions for example in europe this uh the green deal for example and the eu deal that we have seen uh, it's something that it has to be delivered by the leaders of all these countries. So uh, this, this is my response to that. Okay, uh, we're we're, all, we're running out of time, so I'll ask a couple of questions which have come in from the audience. I mean, one is uh, Andreas. In your uh, presentation, your last um, kind of major point was uh, that recovery plans are a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to encourage sustainable, inclusive, and green growth reforms and the question is how likely do you think that this will happen i mean obviously in terms of esg the environment and so on and so forth it's, it's all we really hear about in discussions these days from investors uh, mm -hmm. and from many others besides how likely are these recovery plans to take this on board and then and then after that tim in terms of shipping also esg clean propulsion and all the rest of it is this an opportunity for the industry to take the whole thing on board andreas first Yes, look, I see it very likely from happening, and the reason is that, uh, as I said before, this is not a blanket check that uh, member states will be getting. Uh, they have to demonstrate that they have an action plan in place. Some of the uh, member states in the EU in the EU have already published their action plans, so you you see that it is tangible, and there will be some timelines, and you need to be achieving these timelines to get the money dispersed. So uh, I know also Cyprus is working on an action plan uh, to be delivered uh, uh, very soon. 
so yes, I'm quite confident that it will happen. It is an opportunity. The risk is whether this money go on the sustainable projects that need to happen. You understand and you have to appreciate that uh, the EU wants to help with this money. So there has to be a, so, a thorough work uh, before uh, uh, the, the whole assessment of what is actually needed, again, based on the EU priorities. Uh, and then uh, I'm quite confident that uh, this money will be used and will be a huge injection in all European countries. Thank you. Tim, can shipping come together and push this agenda? Well, the challenge is, uh, is for, the, for this industry is uh, enormously fragmented if you look at it as a global. Uh, what can a small, um, handy size bulk owner do about this? Um, you know, there, is, there are so many uncertainties. What fuel should I be using? Um, um, how do I manage to afford all of this? So, it, so making it happen is, is very challenging. Um, and then there will need to be a lot of leadership uh, but if you look at, I mean, if you look at the, the, the there are moves now happening. Uh, personally, I have no doubt that it will happen. It must do because um, our children and their children will not tolerate anything less. And the pressure on IMO and the whole industry will get, will increase in, inevitably. So there will be solutions found. What there will be, you know, is it going to be ammonia? Is it going to be hydrogen? Uh, that is still being thrashed out. But, you know, we had the, uh, the new um, CMA CGM LNG fuel um, mega container ship, which is 23,000, fully loaded, first voyage westbound. You know, I think that is an important event, and it shows that there are owners, uh, obviously in certain sectors uh, where they've got the scale, who are putting money into this, uh, and they are they are sincerely working to um, uh, to deliver this change. So it's going to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, a final, a final question, uh, one which again came in from the audience. Uh, let's uh, jump forward uh, five or perhaps ten years. Will 2020 just be a blip on a chart or will there be uh, longer term uh, consequences? Tim? I think it probably will be a bit. Well, there are, in terms of the trade flows, it will be a blip on the chart. Um, are there any the, the really interesting questions? Are there fundamental changes that emerge from this, or is it simply um, a continuation of existing trends? You know what we've what the container shipping industry has demonstrated is that it can manage itself in a crisis. I be believe this is a real turning point, and that that an industry that has been d delivering dismal returns is now going to be sustainably profitable. So that I think is probably the main landmark. As far as the other sectors are concerned, I'm not really. Sure. I don't think it's it was going to be, I think it's going to be a blip. I think it's going to be a blip. Okay. And Andreas, in terms of economic growth in the global economy? Yes. I, I would say that uh, it could be a blink in terms of data, all right? I mean, you will just see a recession, obviously, but it will be a transformational blink. It will be something that um, accelerates uh, digital transformation. We are seeing it in the whole world, even in shipping. Uh, and, and shipping was already. I think ahead of the game, we, we were discussing last year, if you remember in the year before, blockchain, smart chips and all that. Uh, so this acceleration and the automation uh, is, is much needed. Uh, so uh, that's another silver lining. Okay, excellent. So uh, that's the end of our first session. Uh, Tim uh, and Andreas, thank you very much. And, and earlier on, uh, Mr. Uh, Dimitriadis, uh, Shipping Deputy Minister. Thank you very much for this first session. Thank Our you. next session is at uh, one o'clock Cyprus time in almost one hour from now. The title Cypriot Shipping Banks and Market Profile. I hope you'll be able to join us here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Thank team. You. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Andres. Bye. Goodbye.